There's no place to escape to. This is the last time. Oh, yes. On the left. <laughs> That's when the cannibalism started. Uh, Chicago Rippers. Well, I'm sitting next to a real Wisconsin Ripper right here. It's because of the sparks. <laughs> no, that's not true. This whole place smells like broccoli, and it has nothing to do with me, Mr. Zabrowski. I don't know, but that's the best joke I'm going to have today. <laughs> that's it. What an episode it's going to be. It's already out. It's already you want out. me to intro right now? You usually do like 30 minutes. They're 30 minutes. 30, 30 minutes. Seconds. Seconds. I mean, the comedy is so good, I could have it for 30 minutes. And that's what everybody <laughs> you know says. What they, you know what they call me? The Chicago Ripper because of my farts. I said it. It's the Wisconsin, Wisconsin wow. Ripper. That's where you're from. It's different. Again, I do prefer the way I phrased it. Yeah. But, and Because the audience always says, more banter up top. More banter. More banter. Oh, that's they what it. they want. They Less love content. The, more banter. The one thing when I listen to a podcast that yeah. I really, I always think like, I hope that they talk sh- bull about bullshit that I don't care about for 20 minutes before they actually get to the topic and then they, they care say, about. Well, let's just jump right in. <laughs> so <laughs> speaking of that, Marcus, what do you think of the new series of Top Chef? <laughs> Welcome to last podcast on the left, everyone. Ben hanging out with Henry and Marcus. It's a hot day. And indeed, Henry is wearing his hot boy shorts. Yeah, look at him. Wow, those are something else. Your legs are in full bloom. It's summertime, summertime indeed. My legs are just condensing. They're uh-huh. doing something. Uh-huh. Well, yeah, you speaking see, look of, at, it's, it's these yes. meats that were tough. The it, meats <laughs> highest on my thighs towards my balls are like, that's the... That's the worst part of me. It's getting gotcha. a little Meg Ryan. It's getting a little leathery there. <laughs> oh, oh right. shots fired. No, not really. She's still beautiful to me. She faked an <laughs> orgasm. Yeah, like women do that. Okay, here we go. Chicago Rippers part two. I like that this was the, this is the, how do you put it? Maybe least prepared, but the top of this episode, uh, going into probably one of our most grisly stories we've told in years. Yeah, yeah man. Very I, long time. I just ran into Marcus on the stairs the other day. You know what we do on the stairs. It's mm-hmm. like a prison around here. And uh, yeah, he said a couple of things we'll be talking about today, and it's uh, thoroughly disgusting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because I gagged just thinking about the dog hair on the underwear last week. Yeah, right. Oh, it's getting worse uh, than that. So yeah. we're all prepared now. Now, mm-hmm. now today's going to get your goat. I don't want to think about animals in any way. <laughs> <laughs> don't because yeah, I don't I don't want a goat to have to witness any of this. No. no. So when we last left the Chicago Rippers, their most devastating and shortest run of murders following the kidnapping and murder of Lorraine Borowski was just beginning. What came next was six months of pure mayhem on the streets of Chicago. They had a very short career, the Chicago Ripper crew, but they made it count. Wow. Sounds like an XFL team. It is yes. They oh, wow. Honestly, I think the Chicago Rippers is their XFL team. <laughs> Now, as we said last episode, the murders themselves got very little press while they were happening. That being said, there are reasons behind that dearth of coverage outside of the harsh fact that the majority of the victims were black sex workers. First of all, Chicago had a lot of Mm. murders in the late 70s and early 80s. It was kind of a hobby of theirs. It was a big thing. Chicago hit its peak murder rate in 1974 at 970. Wow. And between 1979 and 1981, the years in which the Rippers were active, Chicago still averaged 865 murders per year, seven of which were related to, quote unquote, sex and perversion. Hmm. And at first, I was like, well, that's actually not a lot. In course, that's a lot. There's at, only 365 days a year. But if you look at the amount of murders, it's not a lot in there. But I wonder how much was reported. I wonder what if what is what then done to a sex worker? Does that count to them? Do they decide to let it all go? Because this is one of those. Do they decide you have to have a legit person be murdered for them to count? That's just Chicago. That's not even counting Peoria. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that a is true. A lot of bodies in Peoria. Yeah. No, that, that is true. That is just Chicago proper. But the fact remains that the year in which the Chicago Rippers were the most active, the number of murders related to so-called sex and perversion, they more than doubled to 18 from the year before. So it's not like the needle wasn't being noticeably moved. Everybody was hustling. Yeah. But to be fair, it's not like these bodies were always being left in obvious sites where they'd be found immediately. Some of these were left to decompose in fields for months before they were discovered, Mm. and others weren't found until one of the rippers led police to the bodies themselves. In my personal opinion, the reason why there wasn't a lot of coverage is because nobody knew that there were three to four guys out there murdering. I mean, also, do you want to believe it? No. I don't. Well, because it's very scary. Yeah, it's Mm -hmm. horrifying. Four, three to four Ramirez is out there. Yeah. 
horrifying. They they are though. There are. Yeah. yeah. Well, right I know. Well, let's not think about it. <laughs> But according to Jade Slade Fletcher, author of our source, Deadly Thrills, the biggest reason why the Chicago papers didn't cover the Chicago Ripper murders sufficiently is because Chicago was simultaneously in the thrall of the Tylenol murderer. Whoa, that story is crazy. Did they ever find out who did that? Not necessarily. Well... Not officially. I Wait. think it was Big Advil. <laughs> uh, if there was anybody, if there was a Quee suspect... Bono. I mean, uh, Nuprin. <laughs> Little, Little yellow, yellow killer. Yeah, <laughs> whoa, cool. He flipped it. Nice. He flipped it. He flipped it. it. He flipped it. See, back in 1982, at the exact time that the Rippers were ripping, seven random people in the Chicago area died from taking Tylenol capsules that had been filled with potassium cyanide by persons unknown. This story is Crazy. fucking wild, and we are sort of not fully, but half burning an entire series because nah. we're going to go into this. A we're not, we're slightly, not. But, but we need to do we will. this story as a whole because it's fucking wild. It's yeah. so crazy. Yeah. I mean, we're not burning this series any more than like going and reading a Wikipedia page is going to prevent you, the listener, from listening to a series. I mean, we're I definitely going to do a full, uh, like a rundown on the Tylenol murders. We already solved it. <laughs> yeah. Nuprin, Nuprin, Admiral, where were you? <laughs> Qui bono. Exactly. Now, speaking objectively, the Tylenol murder story had more legs when it came to selling papers because anyone could have been a victim at any time. Oh, yeah. It's like when Joker, you know, in the first Michael Keaton Batman oh, yes. movie, like put poison in all the cosmetics in Gotham mm-hmm. City. Smile it. Yeah, let's mm-hmm. see the guy try. Brad X. <laughs> Love that Joker. <laughs> For example, the first known victim was a 12-year-old named Mary Kellerman, who was given a Tylenol after waking up with a cold. Her condition naturally got worse after taking the pill, so she was hospitalized, and she died the following day, wow. without anyone making the connection of Tylenol death. They thought wow. she died of a stroke. Yeah. And then, a few hours after she died, a postal worker named Adam Janus dropped dead after taking a Tylenol, but the cause of death was pegged as a massive heart attack. Overwhelmed with grief, and this is the huge tragedy. Yeah, this is during the day when the whole family's arrived to grieve over this horrible, oh like, my. sudden death. Yeah, Janice's brother and sister-in-law also took pills from the same bottle of Tylenol, and they also dropped dead. Oh my God, it's like the movie Clue with the cognac. Yeah. And Don't drink it. Yeah, and there was like, in the county where all this happened, they only had like one medical official, which was just this nurse. And so this nurse like went wow. to the house and said like, okay, everybody stop taking everything. I need to look at the fucking pills here. And she looked, she tested, she's like, this is it. Do not, it, it's in the Tylenol. Yeah, and then from there, she's like the hero of all of it. Oh, she really is. Because before, like, even before she came out with it, and they came out with it really quick, Seven people died. People free and it, all from seven. It was seven different people died. What a trip. eight bottles of Tylenol were purchased from seven different stores. It was all over the place. They then figured out that it wasn't it wasn't sourced at the the production plant. Right, someone was doing this at the site of wherever the yeah. the pills were found. The whole city went to a panic. And well, you have that person to thank for how difficult it is to open those GD bottles today. I really, don't mind it. Though. You really do. I know. I, That's I mean, all reason. I it helps. <laughs> Kinda. <laughs> well, as I said, eventually seven people would die across Chicago from taking Tylenol that had been tampered with. And to Jade Slade's point, the murders coincided with the mysterious disappearance of one of the Ripper's non-sex worker victims. Mm. And that disappearance got lost in the shuffle. Yeah, because Tylenol affects families. And yeah. to them, you know, everybody yeah. loves these precious families. They and do. Everyone's just like, oh, these children are the future. But mm-hmm. well, we'll see. Most of the time they spend it. It's, they seem to be spending the future on TikTok. <laughs> Well, very brave statement, Henry. Very brave. It's actually mostly elderly people who are totally broken on TikTok. Yeah, well, yeah, we've, as we have seen. As yeah. we have seen. Well, as a side note, the Tylenol murders have never been officially solved, although it is suspected that a con artist named James Lewis was the perpetrator hmm. because he sent a ransom note to Johnson & Johnson demanding $1 million <laughs> oh, wow. to stop contaminating pills. It's This is just, that is the most simple way to talk about this story. Yeah. Because James Lewis, is a career con man that him and his wow. wife he's this story is fucking wild there's a lot of twists and turns we can't get into it but i think you know in my mind he did it mm-hmm. he's the one who did it well, it seems like he sent a ransom note so well to the point of the continuing media coverage in lieu of the ripper murders 
an amateur chemist named Roger Arnold was named as a suspect in the Tylenol murders. He and, looked evil. Yeah, he looked evil, but he suffered a mental breakdown because the media hounded him so aggressively. Oh, oh yeah, that's not good. Out. But he looked like, to be honest, kind of had Nazi face, right? <laughs> Where you look at him, yeah. very long drawn. It's the circle glasses. Yeah, it's, it's the so, owly yeah. glasses. Yeah. Well, right? they, so they Richard Pearled him. A yeah. little bit. They were yeah. like, oh, you did it. And they haunted this poor man. He yeah. did. Also, what is an amateur chemist, if not a crystal meth maker? What is no. that? How do you, what is an amateur chemist? I do amateur chemistry every day. That's I with add hot a little, sauce and salsa. I put and some seltzer and some bourbon. Yeah. I'm like, oh, it may, it's a smile cocktail. Yeah. And, yeah. and either that really helps. You throw some Advil and then you smoke a bunch of weed <laughs> yeah. and you eat some Advil PM on top of the normal Advil. Right. And then next thing you're like, oh, the family likes me again. Yeah. Chemistry. Yeah, Ben, what kind of American are you to fucking what? tell me that I can't do chemistry in my garage? That's my freedom. I just freedom. don't know if that makes you a chemist. <laughs> An amateur chemist? I have a lab I... coat. I purchased it on Amazon. <laughs> okay. I got a little tag. It says pharmacist H. Zabrowski on it. Mm -hmm. Sounds like that other guy we covered that blew himself up. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, in great distress... Roger Arnold set out to murder the man whom he thought had ratted him out, the bartender at his local. Oh. Uh, yeah. he, he was, was just like, that guy hated yeah, me. Yeah. And it's because you kept ordering Manhattans. This is a fucking dive bar, dude. You get beer, yep. you get shot. True. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the bartender at the local, he was some big fat guy named Marty Sinclair. Tragically, though, Marty Sinclair wasn't the only big fat guy in Chicago. No oh, way. What? <laughs> what? And instead of shooting Marty Sinclair... Roger Arnold shot another big fat guy <laughs> yeah. named John Stanisher. Yeah, he had Ditka face. Yeah, oh, they no. were both straight for him. They were straight for him. They were both almost exactly three hundred and fifty pounds, <laughs> and they both <laughs> looked. Yes. Oh man, I <laughs> shot the wrong fat oh, guy. God, oh God, you could tell. Man. But if you put them both in a tub of water, they would dip, <laughs> displace yes. the same amount. So you could see why he was so confused. Well, naturally, yeah. it's not so much a lineup as much of like a laydown. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Roger subsequently went to prison for murder while big fat John Stanishaw is now unofficially considered the eighth victim of the Tylenol murderer. Okay. You know, I got into a little bit of a research hole the other day about how one of the secret benefits of being very big, mm -hmm. being very fat, is that you're actually less likely to die of gunshot wounds yeah. and a accidental like death, like falling down. It was not down. a research yeah, hole. It was 30 seconds live on Sirius Radio. I did it after <laughs> the fact. Yes. I was deeper. I looked back a deeper, deeper into my material there. Yeah, you can. And I found, it's real, because you can really, your fad's actually kind of like, it helps. Yeah, it really helps. And in today's America, isn't that a benefit? I feel Yikes. like that's why so many people survived in January 6th. It's <laughs> yeah, just the pure be. belly fat really protected a lot of organs. I just yeah. love that literally from your mouth to the president's ear, he's just going to have a whole conversation about getting kids fatter <laughs> to protect them wait. against the we violence need, they face every it's day. It's time. It's uh. time to get fat again. Yes. Make America fat. fat again. There we go. There we go. Fat for the first. We, we are fat now. We were. You remember? Have you seen pictures from the yeah, 70s? Yeah, we were fat then and we're fat now, but yeah. let's continue Con to be continue. fat. Continue. Let's get really get on this Wally train. Really That's get on right. Really get there. Now, the Tylenol murders is a great fucking story, and I didn't even get into a quarter of the entry. No. But perhaps most importantly as to why it got top billing over the Rippers, the Tylenol murders are nowhere near as disgusting mm. or disturbing. Oh, yeah. Yes. Why do you think uh, many actors are chosen over me? <laughs> it's very right. It's like Tylenol murders. Were re it was ready for prime time. Yeah. It, yeah. Really it was easy. I mean, but yes. People, of course, they have an appetite for blood. They always have and they always will. But no matter how many so-called true crime booms come and go, the vast majority of people have a limit. And let me tell you, my friends, today, your limit will be tested. Take and it to the limit. For the first time ever. That's why we're giving out last podcast on the left, Diamond Class. <laughs> this is what you get now. You get yeah. a lanyard. You wow. get a sash. Don't you get tell them. This is the Diamond We're going to want it now. Yeah. This is where we're at for this episode. I thought you were going to say barf bag. Yeah. No, if you're throwing up, I, turn off the show. You're weak. <laughs> oh. yeah, you should, if you're throwing up, you shouldn't. You're listening to the wrong show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, find, go find something that makes you happy. Yeah, go to the Pepto Bismol Hour with, <laughs> with uh, Rachel Maddow. Yes. Oh, Stop that would be fun. Stop listening to things that make you upset. It's not good for oh, you. Yeah, Release man. yourself. Yeah, Maddow won't make you upset at all. It's not no, I, sometimes I'm like, let me hit those bangs. There you <laughs> go. <laughs> Come there on, let me get a little snippet. There you go. 
So on the same day that the Tylenol murders began in Chicago, a woman named Shoy Mack was murdered by the Chicago Rippers Mm. just two weeks after the 8 a.m. kidnapping and murder of Lorraine Borowski. Now, as it was with Lorraine, Shoy Mack was not a sex worker because by this point, the Rippers were acting on near instinct, taking every opportunity to pick up and murder any young woman alone on the streets, Mm. no matter what she did for a living. So Shoy Mack was a 30-year-old Chinese immigrant who had been driving home with her brother Kent after they'd helped close down their family's Chinese food restaurant. Mm. Behind them, in their own car, were the owners of that Chinese food restaurant, Shoy and Kent's parents. Tragically, though, Shoy and her brother got into a tiff during the drive. So Shoy's brother kicked her out of the car, thinking that her parents would see her and pick her up. God, I could never get away with that as a brother. No, Dude, just kick her out and say like, "Oh well, yeah, Jackie, mom and dad." She grips under the frame. <laughs> oh yeah, buddy. She's always grabbing and stuff. I'll yeah. find her in the tire well. <laughs> you can't get rid of her. No, I think she'd kick you out for sure. Yeah. But she's trying. She's got an even lower center of gravity than mm, me, true. so she can come up harder with the big. Was it a pile drive? <laughs> they call that. Absolutely. Like push up with the elbows. Yeah. So yeah, and again, because I'm so top heavy and bottom low, when bottom little, uh-huh. the, the seatbelt holds my gut, mm-hmm. but my legs actually only kind of stick out a little bit kind of like dwarf. Yes. And so Mm -hmm. I am actually much easier to topple over out of a car than Jackie because Jackie is more low set. Yeah. Absolutely. And has a history of bullying. But that's kind of why you got (laughs) to whack her over the head with a sock full of pennies or something first if you're going to do it. But yeah, because again, she's looking through the pennies. (laughs) She knows where the pennies are. She hears them jangling. (laughs) But when Shoy's parents arrived at their house after Shoy's brother, Kent discovered that his parents had missed Shoy standing on the shoulder. Yeah, because it's very random that you kicked your sister out of a fucking moving car. I mean, not moving, but yeah, it's he like... St- he stopped, he kicked... And it's 2 a.m. It's very late. That's a big fight. Yeah, It must have been. It wasn't that big. I think it was something That's like... Sad. He had moved a table. Like, he had stood mm. on a table to paint something, and she was mad. I was like, you can't do that. The customers eat there. Blah, like, oh, was, I see. At the restaurant. Yeah, restaurant. It was some dumb... It was some it was, dumb It was some petty dumb argument. fucking, like, bar... Like, the, the type of fight you see on Kitchen Nightmares. Yeah. You know? Oh. Like, that sort of bickering. My whole life <laughs> is in this meatball <laughs> soup establishment. <laughs> it's my life! Yeah. Rubbish. <laughs> And of course, <laughs> that was my uh, impression. It's, it's this is rubbish. No, that's your Jordan Ramsey impression. Yeah, Gordon Ramsey rubbish. You want to hear mine? Yeah, absolute extraordinary. <laughs> He, he, he never words. says that. No, he no. If you watch, I watch a lot of a lot of Master Chef. It's extraordinary. Yeah. He puts all words together. Extraordinary. Mm, well, there you go. He, he, puts he never all the gives letters compliments. compliments. He does. Yeah, he's actually very kind. He, on the kids one. Uh, on the kids one, yeah. It's constructive otherwise. criticism, and people can understand. If you're going to be in the Master Chef kitchen, you need to have your head in a fucking No, it's swivel. not always constructive <laughs> criticism. Sometimes he puts two pieces of bread on someone's side of the head and says, what am I? And then he, they, that person has to say an idiot sandwich. What's constructive about that? See, that's Gordon <laughs> Ramsay on Hell's Kitchen. Master Chef, he's more of a leader and a guider. Yeah. Hell's Kitchen, he's to understand, if you can't take the heat yeah. of Gordon Ramsay, then you don't belong. And it's literally <laughs> Hell's Kitchen. Let's get so back to Hell in Chicago in the 1970s, please. <laughs> Well, of course. <laughs> all right. Let's all bring, right, it, back. Let's yeah, let's bring it back. I didn't even get into my opinions of the kitchen nightmares. I sacrificed them for the good of the show. Thank you. <laughs> let's just get right into it. Well, let's just hop right in. Let's just hop right in. Let's just get into it. Well, of course, when Kent and his parents went back to pick up Shoy, they found that she was gone. Oh, no. To her extreme misfortune, Shoy Mac had been picked up by the red van driven by Robin Gecht and the Ripper crew. <sighs> Now, according to Eddie Spretzer, he and Robin had been driving around near 2 a.m. when they saw Shoy Mack standing on the side of the road. Robin quickly told Eddie to get in the back, and then he picked up Shoy. And after driving for about 20 minutes, Robin stopped and tapped twice, which was the signal for Eddie to emerge. Horrifying. And after pulling Shoy out of the van, Robin and Eddie beat her before Robin cut off her breasts while Eddie held a wire around her throat. Robin then told Eddie to go grab a knife from the van, but when he returned, he found that Robin was having sex with the wounds in Shoy's chest. Uh, it's, uh, 
Robin then took the knife and cut open Choi's stomach, which was apparently too much for Eddie. At that yeah. point, that was too much. That's the line? That's the line. He got nauseous and returned to the van, or that's what he claimed. Yeah. And Robin joined <laughs> him soon after. They drove off, leaving Choi Mac's mutilated body behind in the field where she was murdered. What's that conversation like? So uh, that was a little weirder, huh? It's What it, the fuck, dude? I, th- I don't believe a word Eddie says when it comes... I. It's hard. When it comes to his participation and how much he participated. Eddie Spretzer, in his confessions, was trying to see... What, we'll get into this a little bit later on. Yes, we'll get into it far more. The cops interrogated them in a circle, mm. right? And they kept where well, they would go back and forth between each one and kind of what we call the prisoner's dilemma, mm. where you go in, in cop interrogation parlance, you go up to the one guy being like, you know, your other buddy already told us everything right. so that you can kind of figure out where all these lines are. Eddie Spretzer always kind of had an eye on making sure Robin Gecht was still the most evil one. They mm-hmm. all knew oh, that. Yeah. They all knew to, knew to do that. So at any point, Eddie Spretzer would think, oh, this is how I, in a way, because everybody's in, in, in uh, all human beings are fighting for a way to validate choices that you make, even if they're bad, good and bad, right? Mm-hmm. You want you want to feel like you're correct. And so Eddie Spretzer would say things, these weird qualifiers of like, and that was too much. Or, yeah, right. I wouldn't go that far, even though you're already aiding and abetting one of the worst series of crimes in crime history. Yeah. But he, he was trying to, that was his way of saving face. Yeah, and right. I think that later on, the satanic cult stuff would also be at the same function. Yeah, well, quote unquote, satanic cult so, stuff. Okay. It would take four months for Shoy Mac's decomposed body to be discovered by a trucker who somehow spotted the corpse from the highway when no one else had. Well, that's your trucker for you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they are he's, good. Oh, he's yeah. always looking for bodies. No, yeah. That's how I always say is I wish my super, if I had a superpower, it would be to know where all skeletons were at all times. That's good. You'd scream. What a superpower. What a yeah, useless so that, superpower. So, that way, I could, like so that, way I could, that way I could lean over to Carolina. I could say like, hey, there's a skeleton over there. Now, Why? <laughs> now that is the most useless thing I've ever Unless heard. Unless you think it would get her like crazy horny. No, it would be, just be fun, and then we could, you know, just they hang out. Do you think eventually, at some point, she would be develop a, a form of sexual <laughs> paranoia? Eventually, she'd be like, "I, we can't have sex here. There's too many skeletons here." And then you yeah. have to start lying, be like, "There's no skeletons you scan, anywhere." You scan, be like, "Oh, I can't see any skeletons over right. here," and mm-hmm. that's how where you figure out where you're gonna have sex. Well, you know I'm- the history of this country, right? <laughs> you're gonna be haunted. It was kind of like a. It was nice because we when we showed up. We had to create sort of a carpet of bodies. Yeah. Just because the ground was so Because no one else was here. Yeah, yeah no one yeah. was like, here. All yeah. these people, that are, why are they here? They don't, they're not here. Well, speaking of which, the site where Shoy Mac was murdered, it was only a mile and a half from where Shoy's brother had thrown her out of the car. Oh, my God. Now, by the time Shoy Mac's body was found, four months after her death, Chicago police had started to notice that out of the hundreds of murders they had to deal with, Every once in a while, a woman's body would show up with one or both breasts missing. Hey, Sergeant Pepperoni, here's the deal. Why don't you go sprinkle a little Tylenol on that body? (laughs) We'll add it. We'll add it to the Tylenol. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I mean, and now that I'm looking at the right, stomach's cut open. All right, face mutilated, breasts are gone. Strong Tylenol. This has got to be Tylenol. (laughs) It's got to be Tylenol. Well, this, of course, meant that Chicago was unlucky enough to be dealing with the serial killer. It's always the last thing a police department wants. They don't yeah. want to deal with it. No. No. Because they're so incredibly difficult to even investigate, much yep. less solve. Yeah. You always got to wait until they trip up. But that's the thing is that once they do trip up, you need forensic evidence in order to make sure that these guys get put away. And yeah. a lot of times, as we've seen again and again with serial killer investigations, the bodies get exhumed. And so the Chicago police were very upfront to the yeah. Mac family saying like, hey, if you bury her, we're probably going to have to exhume the body. Thing was, is that the uh, Macs were devout Buddhists yeah. okay. and their belief stated that once a body is buried, it shall not be disturbed. Oh, so no. these people had to go through the further indignity of having Shoy's body stored in the medical examiner's facility until Eddie Spretzer was convicted three years after wow. her murder. And then only then was her body allowed to be re- laid to rest. Okay. The, uh, at least, though, I mean, the only thing I'll say is that this is a family that at least got some closure. Like mm-hmm. a lot of these people got no closure because as we've talked before about sex worker murder, it's a myth 
that no one's looking for these people. Yes, it is. That is absolutely not true. There are other. They have connections. They're not just. It, they're not just sex robots. They no. have friends and family that are also looking for them. It's just a, you need to have a, a a police department that cares. Yeah, most of the time, like if women are out on the street doing sex work, they're doing it because they have somebody that are they're connected to. Yeah, because they have somebody that they're trying to take care. You're trying of. to make money. Yeah. Lies from your grave. Now, investigators got their first real lead in the Chicago Ripper case in June of 1982. But at the time, not enough bodies had been found to establish that a serial killer was loose. Mm. So the survival of a victim was not as big of a deal as you might think. Put differently, if you think that it's hard to get cops to investigate the murder of a sex worker before they start piling up, imagine how difficult it is to get cops to investigate one attempted murder. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So in June of 1982, a sex worker named Angel York was on her corner on North Avenue when Robin Gecht pulled up alone in his red van, shoved a 45 in her face, and ordered her to get inside. After driving a few blocks to a deserted factory district, Robin forced Angel through a plywood door that separated the cab from the van's cargo hold. Hmm. Now, what's interesting about this attempted murder is that it's one of the few in which Robin acted alone, or at least... It's one of the few that we know of. Yeah, he, I, we, we all believe that he did something beforehand. Yeah, but it's doubly interesting because Robin specifically chose to not murder Angel York. It's mm. almost like he couldn't do it without his little butt boys watching him do it as well. Could yeah, that, was there anything like he wanted her to tell the story? Like, was it like, oh, yeah, go I don't tell know. the other no. sex workers like that they should be killers? scared? No, no, no because no. he it didn't want like them to be that. scared. It's the opposite. He doesn't, we want, no, he wants no one to know. Yeah. Mm. Now, after binding her feet and handcuffing her right hand to her left foot and her left hand to a shelf, Robin put duct tape over Angel's mouth and got undressed himself. He then pulled out a long knife, uncuffed one of her hands, pointed the gun in her face, and told her to cut her own breast. Now, Angel did as much as she could, but she soon started to pass out. That's when Robin reached over and ripped the wound open before he had sex with the wound and ejaculated into it. He then covered the wound with duct tape and kicked Angel out of the van without killing her. Wow, so gross. It's very gross. Ugh. You're right. Yeah, I'm going to say it's gross. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're I'm, pegging you know that what? correct. I will say I'm Ugh. glad you, at no point you're not like, yum. Yeah. Whoa, yeah. No, yeah. that's nasty stuff. Well, security guards soon found her barely alive, and she was taken to a nearby hospital where she gave a statement describing Robin and the van. Hmm. The van? She was really fucked up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She's and incredibly so fucked it up. It took a long time for them to get the statement. And then, but they did. They were technically on it. Well, I mean, they were on it in that they took a statement. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily on it and they actually looked for the guy. Uh, I mean, they took it down that he's a greasy little white guy. He's driving a red van. And they, she said that he had a roach clip hanging from his rear view mirror. Mm -hmm that held two feathers, a blue feather and a white feather. Um, but it seems like the police just added the van to the watch out for this guy pile. Yeah. And then they didn't say like, holy fuck, we got to go find this guy to today. It's just like, okay, watch out for a guy in a red van. He's been beating up hookers. Okay. And that's the most they're going to do with it. Yes. Yeah. Now, Robin Geck was alone during his near deadly assault on Angel York. And as far as we know, those were somewhat rare. From what it seems like, Half of the charge that Robin got from these murders was in directing the other three members of the Ripper crew to commit horrific acts. One possible example of this, if it is true, is what Tommy Cocorellis claimed. Tommy said that Robin forced the other three members of the Ripper crew to eat the breasts of their victims during satanic rituals held in Robin's apartment. It's My known as goodness. the Chicago Cream Donut. <laughs> Now, that ain't they, right. They, that ain't no. That uh, they're a, they're a uh, Zeppeli people. They yeah. are a Zeppeli people. That is definitely uh. a Nippoli Zeppeli. Yeah. How, My goodness. However, these claims must be taken with an enormous grain of salt. I do a loaf of salt, a full, a, <laughs> a full loaf size yeah. crystal yeah. of salt. Yeah. But I well, well. So is this the time? Are we gonna are we gonna want to uncase this? Let's one? get into it. Let's right. get into the satanic claims of the Ripper Crew, which of course everything that I read with the Ripper Crew, it's always satanic murder. The okay. first thing it says, the first fucking sentence, and everything is always satanic murders, satanic mm -hmm. gangs, well, satanic the, ritual, uh, cult, small cult. Well, yeah, reporters love it. 
They yeah. just love, they love to say it. You know, when there was a whole satanic panic thing, we'll talk about it, but the, it was an episode of American Occult. Mm -hmm. It also oh. it features the Chicago Ripper crew because everyone's very fascinated with this angle oh, like yeah. about whether or not they were an organized cult. And I'm just going to say, do you think that they're that organized to I begin with? I don't think they're that organized. No, I, I don't think they're organized. I don't think they're a cult. I don't think Satan had anything to do with it. But he never does. But he never does. <laughs> he have anything to do with murder. He yeah, but let's get He'll into eat, it. You can come. If you're eating cum out of a bucket, Satan might have something to do with it. I <laughs> think so, yeah. No, while it is said that Robin had an altar of sorts in his attic, and while it is said that a copy of the Satanic Bible was found in his apartment. It was a bestseller, and it was also a huge thing in the 70s to have in your house. It was Absolutely. One of those, it was like, you know, Be Here Now or one of those other books where it was cool to have. It was super cool to have. Yeah, it made, you, okay. it made you super edgy if yeah, you I had mean, a copy of the Satanic Bible. It's like now it just makes you like cool super legit oh yeah it's super cool now it's, it's not it's so not an cool. edge lord thing at all no not at all no, no. it's really cool i like that i like those shirts not today jesus <laughs> this they is really where this it. is where the commercialization we, we talked about this with shane morton when you were doing your pretty face going to hell because i remember we were always talking about he's like one day the whole world's gonna be shouting hail satan and i didn't think it was gonna be like this <laughs> Yeah, it's just very Satan's very cute, which no, I do. But he he's he's fun, but I don't think he's cute. Yeah, yeah. I never sure. thought Satan would be on coffee cups. You know, well, it, it's not real. <laughs> is the ultimate thing there. But while it is said that all those things were found in Robin's apartment, it's important to remember what we know about the satanic panic of the 80s and what we know about the patterns of the satanic panic. Specifically, it's important to know how easily children were led on by investigators to make fucked up nonsensical claims. Yeah. I was flushed down a toilet. Old grandma played the piano. All that sorts of bullshit. West Memphis 3 stuff. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the thing. That's exactly the point that I'm getting to. In the case of the Chicago Rippers, we don't have a child, but we do have someone with the intelligence of a child, namely... Tommy Cocorellis. If you mm. watch, there's a current interview of Tommy Cocorellis of when he got out of jail in 2019, uh, which is a long story that we'll sell. We'll, we'll talk a little bit at the end of the episode. But Tommy Cocorellis uh, is I Am Sam. Oh, <laughs> he is great character full, work. He did mm. the thing that they said that Ben Stiller should never do. Yeah, he, he, he is full, not. Yeah, yeah, he is yeah. not like the brightest. No egg no. in the dozen. No, I think Sean Penn should have to be the character from I Am Sam every time he goes to Ukraine. I, yeah, I, <laughs> it might help. It might help because he could teach them the simplicity of love. Isn't it nice? Because <laughs> that's what the Russians need to hear. Yeah. They just need to see one happy. Mm -hmm. Just me. He's sure he's a little simple. He's a little slow, but he gets something that you don't get. What he understands. Sometimes it's all about you just got to take off your shoes. You got to dance in the grass. You have to dance in the grass. I am Sam versus Forrest Gump. Let's see it in the oh, nude. Oh, Forrest Gump will fucking oh, yeah. bury I am Sam. Oh, He's a God. Vietnam hero. Yeah. He would fucking mm -hmm. bounce I am Sam's True. fucking head off yeah. the wall. He is an yeah. athlete. Yeah. yeah. If and you, an athlete. Yeah. If you ever read yeah. the sequel to Forrest Gump, no. that I think was called Gump and Company, yeah. no. you would see that Forrest Gump, you know what he did eventually? He went into space with Raquel Welch and a chimp. Yeah, he well, went space dude again it's not real <laughs> that is not happening i think he's realer than god and satan well he has a movie we got tom hanks he has the outfit well that's true he can dress up as forrest gump but it's basically the same thing yeah, yeah. now it, we're getting back into chaos magic right? yeah that's true i would i do wonder if there's any make-a-wish kid who's like i just want to see forrest gump and then tom hanks has, has to, to show up to do it yeah. well speaking of forrest gump Tommy Cocorellis had the Forrest Gump IQ. It was oh. 75. Actually, I think Forrest Gump's might have been 72. Well, I've never met a mother who cared more about a child's <laughs> education. Really talented work, Henry. <laughs> Well, IQ tests, they're not the be-all, end-all when it comes to intelligence. No. I no. know that they're extraordinarily flawed. No. But even so, a score of 75 doesn't inspire confidence in a man's cognitive skills. You know what doesn't either? When you look at his eyeballs and he has the same eyeballs. You remember the kooky gremlin from <laughs> yeah. Gremlins 2? Yeah. He's got two big and dumb eyeballs goes, looking in yeah. the same direction. They're constantly you know I mean? whirling around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's him. Yeah. Well, that means he's thinking. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's good. See, satanic panic yeah. cases, When your eyeballs yeah. look like the things that mix up slushies at the yeah. movie theater, that's how you know you really think. Yeah. Oh, he's having an internal debate. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, satanic panic cases were notorious for creating massive satanic conspiracies that had no grounding in reality. These conspiracies were often created through extended games of yes and that occur between investigators and victims. 
Sometimes, however, that game will be played by investigators and suspects. Mm. And invariably, those suspects weren't the brightest bulbs in the box. And they were almost always people pleasers. Well, now, what if we are not Orange Julius? What if I started a, sh- a restaurant called Julius Orange? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. We're here to investigate the murder. <laughs> but wait, first of all, wait a second. Did you just say Julius Orange? Yeah, I said Julius Orange. <laughs> This simple murderer is the best yes. businessman I've ever met in my life. It would be really nice. It would be an affordable, kind of nice, sugary treat. We got to send him to Russia. <laughs> this guy's got to talk to Putin. Yeah. <laughs> now, according to Tommy's confession concerning the satanic elements of the murders, the Ripper crew would gather in Robin's apartment after his wife went to work. And there in the apartment, in the apartment's attic, Uh-oh. they would worship something or other at an altar adorned with six red and black crosses. I didn't know apartments had attics. Sometimes they do. Okay. This is a multi-floor. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, after they were all knelt together around the altar, Robin would produce the breasts of murder victims from a trophy box. And while he read passages from the Christian Bible. To sully it. Mm-hmm, oh. Each man would masturbate. Onto a severed breast. Mm-hmm. And then, after everyone, you know how it is. Yeah, yeah I know. And then, I know. Yep. And, yeah, the old salty. Uh, after booze. everyone, yeah. very, good, very, good, very good. After everyone ookied their cookie. Yeah. Robin would allegedly. Can you say gloobied the booby? <laughs> yeah, I guess <laughs> oh, you yeah. could. You could. You could. Robin would allegedly cut up the breast and hand the pieces around for everyone to eat. That's yeah, what I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like that at all. Yeah. No, I was I like, don't. I, I want my own. Yeah. Why do I got to share? Yeah. Why do I got to share with Andrew? They like their peppers and they they don't put ketchup on their hot dogs. They use tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> that is what they do. Yeah. Well, Tommy said that while he was only involved in two murders, he participated in dozens of these rituals. And when police asked him why he participated so many times, Tommy said in all seriousness that Robin had supernatural powers. You know Gandalf? <laughs> yeah. Do you know Gandalf? I don't know him like that. Yeah, I'm committing murders with him. Oh, really? Gandalf yeah. would never do that. No, he wouldn't. And Tommy was therefore afraid of what Robin would do if Tommy didn't go along with everything. I do believe that might be kind of true. This is I, uh-huh. I, I, I have a theory. Yeah. I have a super theory. Well, Tommy elaborated, saying, quote, and this is a, an exact quote. And Henry, I want you to do this exactly as he said it. Yes. He looks into your eyes and he tells you to do something. And you just have to do it. You be real careful when you talk to him, Detective Sam. Don't you look into his eyes. He'll get you too. So Julius Orange, now, is that going to be more of a pop-up or something in the malls? I, I don't like anything that pops up because I get scared. Yeah. <laughs> wow, you are too stupid to kill. Well, he the, was. Yeah, that's the thing oh. about the satanic connection is that after really getting into this story... Tommy's confessions give me pause, if only because I see a lot of parallels between him and Jesse Miss Kelly of the West Memphis Three. Mm. Jesse was himself a low IQ individual who was yeah. led into a false confession of ritualistic murder that led to murder convictions and one near execution. All while the other two members of the West Memphis Three are like, what the fuck are you talking about? I, I didn't do anything. Wait, that with, was the saddest. Oh, yes. I mean, that was so, so sad. But with the West Memphis Three... Two, two, the majority were literally saying we had nothing to do with any of this. Mm-hmm. And one was kind of being led on by the police. Yeah. Yeah. In this case, the other three, they did come out and in confessions at first all said that this shit, some of this shit happened. Three of them out of the four said that they all consumed a breast with, that they had all came on. I mean, right? they I all guess said they're it, closer to doing it than us. But they recanted <laughs> it. They re- they all said after the fact that they that, that none of it was true. Well, to the point of your round robin, the prisoner's dilemma that you said earlier, like we'll definitely get into how Tommy came to confess to we all this. Can satanic you just not support. say come, please? <laughs> <laughs> or quote unquote confess to all these like all this satanic shit. Uh, but I think it was a case of the cops taking Tommy's satanic shit uh, because Tommy wants to please people. He wants to, all right. he wants to do is see a smile on your face. The and Brendan, I say that or say good and, job, Tommy. Yeah, say good job, Tommy. Yeah, the, it, yeah, and th- that's all he wants. And and then they take the cops take the satanic mm. shit to another guy like Eddie Spretzer, who only wants you to be scared of him. And he right. only wants you to think that you're he wants a he wants a cop to look at him and go, 
my God. You're the worst criminal I've seen since my father. Yes, <laughs> Actually, it's, it's part of the reason why yeah. I'm a police officer. Yeah. You're so evil, I feel I can confess to you. He just starts eating a pack of cigarettes. Yeah. And so he says, Oh, I spent yeah, the, the wrong day to quit yeah. eating cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and yeah. so Eddie and Andy, the other member of the crew, Tommy's brother, they both say, like, Yeah, 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 we did satanic shit. Yeah, we, we did, did that, that shit. We did that shit all the fucking time, so man. As an That's ego how fucking boost. evil we are. Yes. Because yeah. yeah. again, they're all tiny little fucks, right? Yeah. They were greasy little shitheads. You are now put in a super max prison. What's a good way to keep everybody from fucking with you immediately? I'm a satanic cannibal that right. has superpowers. That's yeah. what so, Dahmer did, but it didn't really work out for him. No, mm -hmm. it did not. No. But I also, my think that, the, I always believe there's a middle way. Yeah. I think that there is a way when you are all doing, you are already at the, the peak of the most depraved actions a human can do. Yeah, doing real bad shit. And what we've known about every other serial killer, for the most part, they have like lines in the sand. Some of them do. Have mm -hmm. lines, well, I don't go, I don't do this. I don't do this. I don't do this. We see a lot of times, like Ted Bundy was denied the cannibalism, even though at first he was like super all about it. He well, was super it, into it. And the necrophilia, I think he denied too. Yes, he too. tried to say no to. But it's... There's was it, something was it with Bundy? Wasn't it just the necrophilia that yes, he was he into? Yes, he said anything. And then yeah, he yeah. Said but he didn't say anything about cannibalism. But he did do, when it comes to the killing of the of the, of the young girl, he's like, I would, never I, would never yeah, I would never do that. I would never do that. Yeah. Yeah. Shit like that. Where it's like, but this guy, I, I think on some point, you've been doing all these like fucked up shit together. Yeah. This idea gets floated. Yeah. And we are all doing super evil stuff. Because I think that Robin Geck, much like the CIA probably did in various sections of MK Ultra. This is true. You're going to bring MK Ultra. <laughs> yes. Walter, what does yeah. this have to do with Vietnam? Yeah. <laughs> how are we? How, no, I want to. How the fuck in 10 seconds? <laughs> they purposely dressed up in satanic robes so people wouldn't believe what they were doing, right? So they would say you're doing, you're setting up these crazy scenarios and then they're like <laughs> doing the Bill Murray thing. No one's going to believe you because you right. have, the guy was wearing a Bill Clinton mask or whatever. And now back to Robert Gecht. <laughs> Robin Gecht. Or Robin he, Gecht used this quote-unquote satanic line like it was a character that he'd bring out right. that would bring the other two because Eddie Spretzer was on the same page as Robin Gecht and he would help bring Dummy 1 and Dummy 2 closer in for them all to believe that he has magic powers. He probably also liked the role play of it. I imagine yeah. at some point Something like it came out, and they were having some freaky, dumbass night together, and they decided to do something like this, quote unquote, but it was never organized at all. No, I think, well, I think that they had a freaky deaky night where they ended up eating breasts, but I think it was more just getting a little bit too drunk and yes. just thinking, and, but there was no, Who knows? but I don't think there was any ritualistic. I think, I think Robin Gecht is, Robin Gecht is a far more canny criminal than the other three, obviously. But, oh, of course. But I think that all the satanic shit was made up in the room. Sure. I think it was all made up in the interrogation yes, room. Yep, def but, definitely. But I do think it's definitely cannibalism because if you look at other Ripper cases, you know, the Red Ripper, Andre Chikatilo. Also, eventually these cases end up in cannibalism. Yeah, I mean, Almost he's already having time. sex with open wounds. Yeah. Cannibalism is not that far. No, right? no, it's, it's not really worse. Not. I actually think cannibalism is not as bad as that. <laughs> you know well, what? I'm on your side. <laughs> Tough to I'm say. Tough to say. Tough to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, see, Ed, Eddie Spretzer never explicitly implicated Tommy in any of the murders or the sexual assaults. And he psych was there, though. Well, that's the thing. You, we, nah, nah. Yeah. The psychiatrists who have studied his case since his incarceration describe him as a people pleaser with, again, a very low IQ. Doesn't really sound like a people pleaser. Yeah, it did sound like he <laughs> wanted to gonna, please everybody. Yeah, well, like, is that like, it was like Mengele just yeah. trying to please Hitler? <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, is it? Well, additionally, I don't know. as we'll discuss later, Chicago police weren't always the most ethical when it came to eliciting confessions. No. Now, I will admit, it is definitely a toss-up as to whether Tommy was involved in the murders. Most mm. likely he was, as you said, Henry, most likely he was involved in, at the very least, sexual assaults yeah, at some point. I, I think he was there. You know Possibly. what I mean? Like, maybe during, not do it, yeah. during certain crimes he certain was crimes, there. Certain crimes, yeah. But I don't think he ever participated in murders, but, you know, he definitely deserved to go to jail. Close enough. He yeah. should probably still be in jail. Yeah. He's free now yeah. in a Christian. He's, well, no, I should we'll, do an I Yeah, we'll get to it. But I will also say that I'm always suspicious when a confession is paired with unsubstantiated claims of wacky satanic rituals. We always are. Of course. Yeah. Because I've been in wacky satanic rituals, and they're largely very nice. Yeah. No, yeah. And they're certainly helping your career out. <laughs> they were for a while. Yeah. 
And my point will be strengthened later in this episode when we discuss the original source of these cultish claims. Now, after the attack on Angel York, all police knew was that they might be looking for a little guy with greasy hair driving a red van. But from what I can tell, they hadn't quite connected him to the Ripper murders themselves because I don't think they knew at this point that the Ripper murders had happened. Oh, I don't okay. think they knew that a serial killer existed just yet. Oh. Right after Andrew York was found. Because but I that, would I would make that connection you'd if make I that did. Connection. Yeah. 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 yeah, now I would. But that, right. But that ambiguity would change very quickly into certainty. Oh. <gasps> After Andrew York came sex worker Sandra Delaware, whose body was left under a bridge after being gang raped by Andy, Eddie, and Robin. As a final indignity before she died, Andy forced the neck of a wine bottle up her anus, then made her sit on it. Oh my. He then pushed her down on the bottle, shoving it up into her innards and releasing a large pool of blood. Oh. I'm sorry, Fernando. God, this is <laughs> Fernando, it's so These guys are so funny. He's doing might his be, best. They might be the nastiest fucking pieces of shit oh, we've well, covered. I yeah. still Ant Hill kids. And there's are, still more to go. Ant Hill kids, I still put up there. Yeah, yeah that's Rock yeah, that, yeah, that crew yeah. there. Mm-hmm. There's something about this, though, that's really just so frightening. Yes. After Sandra was marketing executive Rose Davis, whose very public murder was mm. arguably what finally brought the Chicago Rippers to the front pages of the Chicago papers. Wow. So how did they get a hold of her then? It Kidnapped was... her off the fucking street. Oh, just yeah. walking down the street. She was walking oh, down yeah. the street. That at became two... their MO. That's yeah. so, like they didn't, they so they were just like sex workers. They were too easy. Let's go Not on. Not even too no, easy because was... Shoy Mac was, Shoy Mac ran a fucking Chinese restaurant with right. her parents. It's like... whoever was easy. It's yeah. whoever okay. was easy to them. Yeah, whoever's out. Because at this point, Lorraine Borowski, they fucking followed her into her office at 8 a.m. Right, their right. Only, their only MO, their only victim type is a young woman alone. And, that, and that's, that's right. It. And that guy in the liquor store, if he would have pointed to the van, that would have been a connection that the cops didn't have there either. Mm-hmm. So yes. the cops were looking for a car. Yes. Well, they had the yeah, van was, idea, but they didn't yeah. really know. Yeah. And, uh, and again, 970 murders. There's right. a lot to look at. And that's just murders. You know, there's not even consent. That's not even considering everything else that's going wrong in Chicago. Right. And that's just Chicago. Yeah. yeah. Rose was kidnapped off the street by Andy, Eddie, and Robin while she was walking to her car at 2.30 a.m. after she just stayed out late having drinks with a client. She's just a marketing executive. She was then taken to an alleyway where the Ripper crew mutilated her extensively in public. When Rose's body was found half-sitting against a wall in the alley where she was murdered, her nose and eye sockets were crushed, her jaw was broken, her face was unrecognizable. Again, her breasts were slashed with such force that blood spatters were found in a nine-foot radius around her body, and a piece of broken lumber had been shoved into her vagina up to the small intestine. Because all of this was done while she was still alive. They're oh all making each other one up each other, and then again, it's the fucked up thing. It's four on one. Mm-hmm. Mm. Now at this point, the cops. Definitely knew that there was a serial killer on the loose. Yeah, I would think so. Yeah. Although they had no idea that the murders were actually being committed by a team of serial killers. Which makes it so much harder, yeah. too. Well, kind of. But then also, if you get one, you'll get all of them. Yeah, but you know that there's more than one. Mm, that, but I would, also, I would also say that having multiple killers might make it easier because there's more people to slip up. Yes, it gets just hard because it's the the crimes themselves that yeah. are so nasty. Yeah. yeah, they are. It's so hard to parse through all of this stuff. It really is. Yeah, it's very I mean, knowing what we know now, I would imagine that if this were to happen in modern day, I think they would be able to peg pretty quickly. It's like, oh, there were four guys here. I mm. I bet you at this point they did know that there yeah. was multiple. Probably. But then but that's the thing. They brought in Robert Ressler yeah. to consult. They're like, okay, we've got a guy. Let's bring in the biggest, baddest FBI behavioral science guy we got. Let's mm-hmm. get the guy like Mindhunter. Was it the fucking uh, Tetch in Mindhunter? The guy with okay. the haircut? Yeah, the, yeah, that, yeah, the guy, guy was in Fight Club. Yeah, that's yeah. that was based on Robert Ressler. Okay. Now, Ressler was spot on with his profiles at times, but when it came to the Ripper case, he sort of whiffed it. Mm. Well, he did guess that the killer was small and skinny. He also said that the killer had effeminate features and was most likely bisexual, perhaps even latently homosexual. Why they, did he think that? Probably because the destruction of the body and the sexual organs and the oh. idea that you're punishing somebody for those you, with hate. Mm. Yeah. I, I I want to be this. I want to have this. But that or was like a, I, yeah, he it, got it, tripped up on that a lot. There he was, got tripped up on it. Yeah, like there was Robert a lot Ressler, of that. He, he's, he was absolutely 
revolutionary, but he was also wrong a lot. Well, it's a social science. You're not going to get a hundo. There was also like, like at the time, because they were just finally getting past true homophobia, but they still were deeply embedded in like transphobia. Oh, yeah. And did not understand how any of that shit worked at all. No. So they're always just been like, yeah, obviously he wanted, he was mad because he didn't have breasts. And yeah, it's like, right. doesn't make any sense. And yeah. it makes some sense. Well, as we learned with uh, Richard Speck, you can get some titties. Oh, that's the <laughs> easiest I'll thing. Get, I'll get you a pair of titties right now. I got them right now. <laughs> there you go. Well, this profile from Robert Bressler unfortunately led police to a hairdresser with the fantastic name of Jacques Monaco. How would Jacques I ever Mon- murder anyone? I was at the gala. <laughs> yeah, Jacques Ma- Monaco ain't killing no yeah, one. Jacques Come Monaco on. is going to the loafers pool. <laughs> Absolutely. He just wants to be at the pool with the fucking martini. Yeah, Jacques yeah, Monaco. I'm not saying I want to wait on him when he comes into the restaurant. He might be, he might be he a might little be very bit, of, specific. Might be a, a bit of a James Corden type, yeah. but I don't think he's a killer. Yeah. Jacques Monaco lived in one of the buildings that was separated by the alley in which Rose Davis was killed and abandoned. During the Josie Martinez mixer, there was no <laughs> way I was there. So literally, they were just like, who lives key close here? Here is Jacques. Here, here. Yeah. You can just arrest that gay. Yeah. Here we go, right there. You can tell by scarf. Got him, Dan. Oh, lock him up. Well, it was. They Robert Wrestler came in, said, you're looking for an effeminate guy. So they just knocked on all the doors. <laughs> Hello. The- yeah, immediately. <laughs> oh, we got, like, we got him. We got him. We yeah. got him. Yeah, and they, well, that's the thing is that Jacques Monaco said that he did hear a quote unquote commotion outside, but he said that he didn't call 911. And so, when oh, yeah, said, 970 murders. That's why he didn't call 911. It's because it's really fucking dangerous out there and you don't want to get involved. Hear yeah. me out. Let's play Phantom of the Opera real loud. See who comes. <laughs> <laughs> that would be, that's me. Yeah. Ah, you're arrested. No, oh, and they'll find out. Oh, he's so gay. He's straight. Whoa. <laughs> Finish it for me. The music of the night. Well, you didn't sing it well enough. You've been canceled. No. <laughs> Sorry, Phantom. No, that's the thing. They talked to Jacques Monaco. He said he didn't call 911. They found that suspicious, but they eventually let it go when it became obvious that a man such as Jacques Monaco could ever be guilty of such a crime. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, it's currently the spring. I was wearing my whites. <laughs> I would never kill a woman in my whites. I believe it, Mr. Monaco. Lie from your grave. Now, the murder of Rose Davis was obviously reckless, and we can assume from both this and the Ripper crew's next murder that they, and especially Robin Gecht, were starting to feel invincible. Case in point, Mm. on October 6, 1982, Eddie was driving the Red Ripper van through a Puerto Rican neighborhood while Robin rode in the passenger seat. They spotted three guys at a phone booth and Robin told Eddie to slow down. Completely on impulse and without any motivation, Robin pulled out a 38 Special and a rifle and just fired five shots. At yeah. the guys, just, told Eddie to speed away. Just full natural born killer behavior. Just okay. like the actual, just, just total mayhem. Yeah, total mayhem. Killed one guy, shot him in the head. Paralyzed another guy, shot him in the head. The third guy ran off. And when the Ripper crew wow. was caught, like Eddie, he copped to these crimes, but he's like, I don't know why he did it. Let me just put it this way, okay? Robin. Not a nice guy. <laughs> not a nice guy at all. Seems a little impulsive yeah. as well. But as it always goes with serial killers, it's when they get reckless that they get caught. And hours after the drive-by shooting, Robin would pick up his last victim. This one, however, would survive to positively identify her assailant. All right. Beverly Washington, a sex... That's good. It is good. (laughs) Beverly Washington, a sex worker walking her usual corner on North Avenue and Troop got picked up by Robin after he offered $25 for fellatio. Ooh, who's that? (laughs) Not today, fellatio. What? Bye, fellatio. (laughs) That doesn't make any sense. Bye, fellatio. I get it, fellatio. Kiss all. That's good. Bye, fellatio. Well, Beverly agreed. But once she walked through the plywood door separating the cab from the cargo, Robin pulled his gun and told her that if she only did what he said, she wouldn't get hurt. Now, Beverly was a seasoned woman of the night, and she figured that she'd run across what some girls called a hooker freak. Some so-called hooker freaks were guys who got off on humiliation. They Mm. like getting peed on. They like getting told that they were a bad widow boy. Sometimes you are, and you got to be corrected by a stern woman. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) who knows? Unfortunately, that's just the rule. That's just what happens. That's just how it's got to be. You know, I mean, I definitely get more stressed out during tax season. Oh, yeah. (laughs) 
But some, like Beverly assumed of Robin, they liked to hold a gun to a woman's head while she screamed. It was a request. But there wasn't anything particularly dangerous about the gun scenario, so long as the gun wasn't loaded, as right. Beverly had discovered in the past. It's just a fantasy. Some guys just got to get it out. Beverly could have I mean, really been needed there on that set of that, Rust. That truly, <laughs> really, really could have been. Her. Well, honestly, that is a very seasoned sex worker. Just yeah. mean like getting a gun pulled on you and like, all right. Oh, <laughs> no, <laughs> don't kill me. Okay, let's get it going. My yeah. Instagram feed has just been this 70-year-old sex worker. You know, she's just been talking about all this stuff. It's been very interesting. Biggest cock she ever saw, 11 inches. She called it a two-hander. Couldn't fit in any of the holes. She doesn't do anal. She liked it like a lollipop. <laughs> That's what she said. <laughs> do you have She's, her information? Or? No. So she's on my at gmail.com. What's her name? What's, what's her handle? I don't know, but it's all over my Instagram. <laughs> Reach out to Kissel. I got Reach the guilt. I think the guilt. Our phones have been talking. Now I'm yeah, getting now the you're getting the guilt. The guilt uh, disease? Yeah. I'm next. I'm just not. I'm just going to let it happen. I'm not going to look for it. I'm just going to let it happen. <laughs> let it happen. No, the way you do it is that uh, you be half asleep, look at your phone. You're like, oh, boobies. Click on it. See the face. You're like, oh, oh. very old woman. <laughs> not too shabby. <laughs> but with Robin, once the knife came out, Beverly knew that she'd landed in a bad spot. And when Robin forced her to swallow a handful of pills, she had no idea whether or not she was ever going to wake up again. But wake up she did the next morning on North Maplewood, where a homeless man found her. Her left breast had been removed so completely that her ribs were visible. And her right breast was attached only by a few strands of flesh. Mm. But the important thing was that Beverly was still alive. She was taken to the nearest hospital where she was stabilized, although she was unable to speak when detectives arrived. Anxious to get whatever information they could, they asked her a series of yes or no questions, telling her to blink for a yes and shake her head for no. They soon confirmed that she'd been picked up by a greasy little white guy in a red van, and before long, they had her writing words describing her attacker. Mustache, blue jeans, flannel shirt, greasy hair. When asked to describe the van, she wrote, Roach clip. Rear view mirror, two feathers, white, blue. Yeah, if we've only we heard about it. this before. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I've been too focused on my goddamn Julius Orange business. <laughs> it's failing. I tell you what, I've been hollering outside the offices of New Print for the last yes, two weeks yes. for the truth. I know. And with that, Beverly's descriptions match those of Angel York's. So police had everything they needed to narrow the search. Although there were apparently a shitload of red vans in Chicago. Sure. How and many probably, are we talking here? Like a thousand? I mean, still, you have, it's narrower. A lot. I mean, it's narrowed down. And I am I would imagine Chicago, like most metropolitan police departments in the late 70s, early 80s, were wi vastly um, undermanned. Who knows? Because those yeah. Chicago Bears, red, blue. Right? There's probably a lot of red vans in there, right? You get Chicago Bears like, aren't, red, aren't red blue at all. Are they red blue? No. No, they're no, like the, the, blue the, and then... I guess like, there's no, a little like, bit of They're brown. Red. They're brown. No, they're they? not Those brown. are the browns. No, it's the Chicago... No. Are they red? And no, the, they're like... They're like a dark blue. navy blue with a red. Was it like an orange? It's like orange. Chicago Bears. Yeah, it's the See, fucking. That's why the fuck are they're we orange and black? I'm just saying. Orange and dark blue. Sometimes it's dark blue. And red. He was trying. He was I trying. Was and he didn't yeah, mention the was. CIA. He was trying not to mention MK Ultra. I did good. And so yeah. you did do good. Super Bowl Shuffle. Yeah. Remember that? Oh, yeah. I remember that. Oh, remember well, that? Simple Time. Super Bowl Shuffle. Simple Time. I remember all they had to do <laughs> was mm -hmm. go on a chilling off show and dance. And that's all football players had to do back in the day. That's right. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess to that point, Henry. They did pull over a lot of orange vans. They Fuck probably, you. maybe they pulled over the fridge. I am right sometimes. <laughs> they pulled over pink vans, copper vans, maroon vans, whatever was even close to red. It's a any, spectrum. Any van. But on October 20th, two officers pulled over a red van with a plywood partition and a roach clip hanging from the rear view mirror. And dangling from the roach clip were two feathers, one white, one blue. But driving the van hmm. was Eddie Spritzer. Oh, and even though Beverly's description was of Robin Gecht, the van was exactly as she described it. You know, all this happened while Barack Obama was in Chicago, right? I right. blame him. Yeah, it's another actually, smush no, on his actually, presidency. No, I don't think it. I think he was. Um, I actually cannot in believe Hawaii. Barack Obama would allow this. <laughs> he did that. I he should have been wow. in Chicago. I think he was in he Hawaii. Was, oh, point. he was on vacation. <laughs> Yep, oh, he could have solved it. Up the race. No, so that's where he grew up because he grew up in, in Hawaii. Oh, Mostly nobody Hawaii. grows up in Hawaii. <laughs> oh, a lot of people do. I was just listening no, to my. No, they're all shipped in. <laughs> I was listening to my Kevin and Sluggo on the way over here. Yours. Hawaii. Oh, yeah, it's my favorite show. Uh, Hawaii, the number one most expensive place for a home. The 
median in uh, home, $680,000 to buy. Yeah, I mean, when there's less homes. It's a tiny island. Anyway, so I guess he didn't grow up that poor. <laughs> <laughs> this is back in the day, though. Interesting. Barack Obama moved to Chicago at the end of 1982 after the Chicago Ripper murders. Should have been there. <laughs> solved it. Should have been there. Where was Michelle? <laughs> Bo? God damn it, Bo. <laughs> well, Eddie wasn't the coolest cucumber. No, I don't think any of them are cool cucumbers. No. Uh, Robin Gecht is. We'll get to that here in a second. <sighs> Well, well, but when Eddie maybe, was maybe a smoother criminal, yeah, maybe so. But, <laughs> yeah, Eddie stammered and stuttered his way through the entire stop, and he immediately said, "This is not my van. This it's is Robin Gecht's van. <laughs> this is Robin Gecht's van. <laughs> and he, Robin Gecht, G E T. Right, it's Gecht." Yeah, and he immediately Gecht. gave him gave the cops his address. It's right here, six 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 Asshole Avenue. <laughs> go over there. Go get him. So remember, when you get pulled over, Eddie, don't tell him anything about Robin me. Gecht. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, I gotta get it out. <laughs> well, when they arrived at Robin's house, he was Gecht was at ease. He was smiling. He showed no sign that he knew why the cops were there. But regardless, he matched Beverly Washington's description of a greasy little fuck perfectly, so they hauled his ass in. Beverly easily picked him out of a lineup, saying, That's the bastard. Right. So Rob Yeah, she pulled they pulled her, they brought him yeah. to her at the hospital. Oh, and they literally God, I'd like, be like, Can you get him out of here? Oh please? no, she started screaming. That was it yeah. was it was like a scene from a movie where yeah. they oh. brought him in and she starts freaking out and then they just pull him yeah. they pull him right out. So Robin was arrested, and since Eddie was driving the van, he was arrested too. Reportedly, when Robin was told he was being arrested, he responded with an open mouth and put his hand to his chest as if to say, Mom, Oh my, me. honestly, he's acting like a real Monica. There's no <laughs> real ice. Just been like, there's no way I could have done this. I was at Juana Martinez Mixer. The spring. <laughs> yeah. It's the white season. I can't be killing people when I'm in my white. I don't know if you were invited, buddy. However, all they could charge Robin with was aggravated battery, deviant sexual assault, armed robbery, and kidnapping. Yeah, because she didn't die. Yeah, that, this first one did not die. Yeah. Isn't that a lot? It's a lot, it's but not it's enough. not murder. No, it's yeah. not enough. And Robin, he said nothing except to ask for a lawyer when he was questioned. Oh, he yes. just kept saying, lawyer, lawyer, never said anything, never confessed to anything. Well, ever. if you're the cops, you got to be like, say the word lawyer if you're guilty. <laughs> You, yes. That's where I got nice. you. Uh, Robin Gecht and John Wayne Gacy are the same type of, I mean, obviously, asshole. No. But this type of criminal where they want their crimes to die with them. Mm. They, it belongs to them. John Wayne Gacy, because I've been, I'll explain why. I went back through a bunch of his shit recently. It's the, I think it's the 30th anniversary of his execution is today. Jeez, is that um, right? I believe that John Wayne Gacy wow. was executed. I know it was May 10th. Well, um, he definitely didn't leave a good corpse. No, he did not. Wow, that is one big old fried uh, chicken right there. 30 years next year. It's 29 years 29 today. years. Wow. Yes. And so May John, 11th. Yeah, so, well, I mean, 10th to the 11th. You know, they do it at midnight. They do it at midnight. Yeah. They go, uh, but John Wayne Gacy hmm. was such a control freak that he wanted to make sure even his narrative was entirely owned by him. Yeah. He didn't want anybody to fucking yeah. go, and they didn't want anybody to be able to know. He didn't, because he felt that confessing would lower himself yeah. to these police officers. He's one, obviously one of the worst bastards. I was just wondering, life. are there any buildings that John Wayne Gacy built that are still there? Gotta be. I mean, there yes. must be. A ton. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's weird. Yeah. But even though Robin Gecht refused to cooperate in any way whatsoever and just kept deflecting and deflecting, mm -hmm. Eddie Spritzer was a different story. Yeah. I mean, I thought it was really weird when Robin brought up Hunter Biden's laptop. <laughs> and it's like, buddy. It is We're nothing. on it. We and then they really got into a hard discussion. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. We do need to talk about Hunter. <laughs> yeah. Let's look into it. Well, after being pushed, Eddie fell to pieces and filled a 78-page written statement detailing his relationship with Robin Gecht and the murders that they'd committed together as the Ripper crew. Wow. From what Eddie said, the first actual murder occurred when they picked up a sex worker, then they blindfolded and gagged her. Robin then just shot her in the head, which tracks with what we know about escalating serial killer behavior. It starts very simple, then gets much more ornate as it goes on. Mm. The disposal method, however, was quite different. Lord knows where they got him from. But allegedly, 
Eddie, Andy, and Robin chained bowling balls to the victim's neck and feet like it was a fucking Popeye cartoon mm. before they threw the corpse into a body of water. Well, I'm I mean, going to say Chicago, this, right? There's yeah. a lot of bowling. I think that it's a bowler town. <laughs> it, and is a, I, it really is. And again, yeah, but due is. to diabetes, due to certain things, it could probably, you know, f- full of chalk. Chicago is full of. Different various different foot diseases. Yeah. And knee, oh, absolutely. Knee problems. Vascular diseases. Dude, I see yeah. a lot of bowlers just quit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> on their way to the lane, just being like, fuck this. Yeah. I got to get a sitting down sport. I got to fight. I yeah. got to fly drones for the army. <laughs> like, I can't do this. So they yeah. would just leave their bowling balls. I mean, I would imagine. Like it's like seeing a pile of headshots in L.A. jammed into a <laughs> yeah. trash can. I forget there's that one bar that puts them all up. With they, residuals. Uh, residuals yeah. But isn't it after you leave L.A.? Like after you fail as an actor, you they put your headshot your shit, up. Yeah. Um, but I would assume that most bowling alleys, 80% of them bowling balls ain't used. There's only so many good bowling balls in a bowling alley. Yeah, that's true. So wait only, a so many are good, only so many get the fingers. You're talking about <laughs> are these like Nepo balls? No, I, I feel just like there just are live. Ball, well, there are balls that are more when you're hunting for your ball at a bowling alley. Some do pick me, pick me, pick me. They do, and then you're like, sweet, look at the holes on that one. They do whisper. Yeah, I like the ones that are translucent. Mm. Oh, those are cool. Are cool. I like the one with the rose in it. Yeah, like, uh, yeah. was it Bill Murray's Bill Murray character? Kingpin, yeah. King. Oh, that movie's good. Yeah, I wish that we were talking about Kingpin. <laughs> Instead of <laughs> wine bottles, but let's just jump right into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, <laughs> just, let's, just, let's just jump just get, right let's in. Let's get right, let's get right to it. Well, when it came to the known murders, Eddie vacillated between taking responsibility and removing himself from the process altogether. He claimed to have once vomited after Robin beat a woman with a hammer. That was presumably Rose Davis. But Eddie also admitted to cutting off breasts, and he admitted to having sex with the gaping wounds. <sighs> But concerning Eddie's... It's whatever was convenient for him. Right. Yeah, okay. wh- whatever made him sound more like a badass at the time. But concerning Eddie's wishy-washiness, a woman who had known him for six years said that she called him a sissy for one reason or another, just on a random day. They were talking about something like, ah, Eddie is such a sissy. And Eddie responded by saying that he wasn't a sissy because, no, he'd, because he'd, quote, killed a couple of broads and he'd, quote, cut their tits off and that it was, quote, very messy. Well, I guess I take it back. <laughs> wow. I thought you were a sissy. Turns out you're a real hunk. You're cool. <laughs> wow. Now, by the time Eddie finished with his first statement, he'd given up seven murders and one aggravated assault, which investigators felt they could use against Robin Gecht as leverage. The most powerful force in the universe. <laughs> but according to what Eddie claimed later, years later, the interrogation process was far worse than a gentle conversation. According to his story, it took five days for him to break, mm. during which a detective named Flynn psychologically and physically tortured him. I, uh, you know, I don't care. I, we I'm don't really care. sorry to say this. This is one of the rare times where I'm just like slam his fucking head into yeah, a table. Wail on him. Uh, Beat him. I don't care. I mean, the problem is it destroys everything for court. Like, that's the true issue. Right. But the idea that it took him five days to break. <coughs> yeah. Bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> Bullshit. I think that he was ready to sing. He was already being like, Robin Gex fan. Robin Gex fan. Like he was right. already doing. Yeah. But yeah, I I don't think they were gentle with no, him. No, absolutely not. But but from what Eddie said, Detective Flynn took him out to the woods and forced him to dig a grave. Sure, sure. Cops are definitely in they're super I'm, activated. I'm gonna give whatever abuse these cops wield upon these people, I'm gonna give them what they call. A mulligan. Mm. On what? That, this is the one. The one. Yeah. You can beat the fuck out of all these guys. <laughs> well, Eddie was allegedly pushed into the grave and the detective fought, kept firing his handgun near Eddie's head <laughs> again and again. They said the cop had to reload three times. That I'm didn't happen. Say, also, that didn't happen. That didn't happen. Is, no way that no, happened. No, you're going to, this whole story, you're just going to keep saying that didn't happen. Oh, okay. that, didn't that, happen. Did, that didn't happen. Well, That's not how it happened. They don't have to go to ornate means. No. To be no. completely frank, we know what they do. They literally, all they have to do is leave you in a room. Yeah. That's it. That's all it takes to break a person is you yep. leave them in there for you can leave them there for three days. You don't have to do this shit. Everyone yeah. has a vice. Mostly everyone has the vice of in need of water. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, you put them in a stress position. That's what they do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, after running out of bullets, the cops that allegedly took Eddie to a car wash and used a pressure hose to remove the grave dirt. That's why Was no one fucking saw fucking Farva from <laughs> Super Troopers. My ass. <laughs> That's why nobody saw a dirty Eddie spritzer. Oh. Sugar. Yeah. It's delicious. It's delicious. It's delicious. <laughs> Then, once the detective shift was over, 
Eddie was taken by two more detectives to an abandoned house where they beat him for hours. Then after he passed out, he said that they pissed on him. Shut the fuck up. They could just do this at the station. Yeah, they could just do this at the station. No one's going to say anything. So this is basically him saying, I only confessed under this. (sighs) This is what it took me to confess. I felt Satan strang through me. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way I succumb. Okay. Well, that's the thing, though, is that it sounds pretty extreme, but it's not that far fetched when it came to the Chicago police. Department. Oh yeah, they beat the living. They definitely beat yeah. the living fuck out of him. Well, mean, and uh, there's still black sites to this day. Oh yeah, there's like yeah. you don't want to be there. Yeah, during the 70s and 80s, co- Chicago cops, and this is documented, they used cattle prods on suspects' testicles. Mm. They would suffocate them with plastic bags. They would burn them with cigarettes. They'd beat them senseless, all to elicit. Confession. Yeah, and but that was at the station. They didn't have to take anyone out. That's no, just no, that was all happening right yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. Right. But what doesn't wash when it comes to Eddie's story is that he told them about at least two murders that the cops hadn't attached to the Ripper at all. And Eddie himself led police to the mausoleum where the body of Lorraine Barowitz had lain undiscovered for over a year. No, he was singing like a fucking songbird the entire goddamn time. As yeah. soon as he arrived, he was drinking milkshakes Henry Lee Lucas style. He doesn't want to say it. <laughs> Right. He doesn't want to know. Yeah, plus it was sh- probably the opposite. Yeah, they just like, treated him like a fucking king. Yeah, yeah they're seriously. bringing him burgers and shit while he's just prattling off every detail he could possibly imagine. I don't know. If, I think that they probably whacked his head a couple times. Probably, I'm sure. Yeah, but the Chicago police they usually reserve their extreme coerced confessions for black men, especially in the 70s and 80s. Eddie Spretzer cool. was very white, and besides, if anyone was going to be tortured into a confession, it was going to be Robin Gett. Because he was the only one who was explicitly described by two near victims. Yeah, he and was he, the guy, yeah. basically. Now, when Robin Gecht was questioned, he was always friendly, but he remained adamant that he was the real victim here. We got to just think about this, right? Look at the description. Mustache, greasy, disgusting. Wow. <laughs> Unbelievable. I can't believe they criticized my greasy hair. This is genetic. I shower every single day. <laughs> After being shown pictures of known victims, Robin dismissed them. And even after Robin was shown that Eddie was actively cooperating with police, didn't even flinch. Didn't it fucking phase him a single second. Wow. Instead, he would well up during descriptions of murders. He'd give him puppy dog eyes and say that he'd never hurt anyone in his life. Fucking piece of shit. Yeah. And interestingly, once Eddie heard that Robin was denying everything, Eddie took his lead and changed the story, saying, like, yeah, Robin never hurt anyone ever. Yeah, 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 yeah that's, no, that's they're not, all playing yeah. games now. Yeah. Instead, Eddie was now saying that the real killer was his ex-girlfriend's brother, his co-worker, Andy Cocorellas. Me! Mm. No. Not me! Andy, not Tommy. I mean, I think that they're pretty similar. <laughs> In my mind. <laughs> well, they're, both, they're the Cocorellis family. Yeah. Technically, Andy was the smart one. Yeah, that's not... <laughs> no, I mean, you know... <sighs> it's like... Which one? I mean, Marcus is the handsome one. I guess right so. us. Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. the heartthrob. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. You're the you're the strength. You're the moral strength. I don't know. And I'm the I'm the, the fucking. What are you? The brains. The brains of the operation. <laughs> yeah. If we're if we're fucking depending on this smile for I, our dollars, the, some people like it. I yeah. think it's more about the content. <laughs> I do. I think people overlook us. Live from your grave. Now, while Andy was being looked into, Robin was ill-advisedly let out on bond after a middle-aged woman that he was having a sexual relationship with uh, took out a mortgage on her house oh, wow. to really, bail him out. I can't believe that they did that. Yeah. It's crazy. Almost, almost immediately, he went out and picked up a woman. This woman named Cynthia Smith immediately went out and picked her up. She recognized Robin too late as the guy who'd slashed a friend of hers. She went to go and try to open the door. Robin had removed the passenger side door handle. And now it's insane to think that nobody in the police department was put on Robin's trail. No, right. nobody they just was like, let him hey, go. look out for that guy. You know, just, don't, just go follow that guy. It Plus, literally just, should have been a detective like me in a dress, whistling, and be like, come on, <laughs> I boys. Just, I don't understand how he was allowed to get bail at all. Like, yeah. I don't understand how he, th- th- that was even possible. I guess she mortgaged her house, so it must have been $100,000. Wow, yeah. Must have, yeah, she mortgaged her house. Yeah, it must have been fucking insane what his bail was. Uh, but Cynthia Smith got lucky. When Robin picked up his homemade glass hatchet and tried stabbing her in the face mm. with it, she clawed her way past Robin and made it out the driver's side door. Robin sped off. Soon after, Andy Cocorellis was brought in for questioning. 
He also confessed before the day was out, going into detail about how the crew had kidnapped women and stabbed them with everything from knives and razors to tin cans and can openers. Jeez. Before it was all over, after the hours of talking about fucking amputated breast and wound sex and all this horrible shit. No shit, dude. Andy Cocorellis had confessed to 18 murders. Wow. Including those of Rose Davis and Lorraine Borowski. So he, you know, and more then he than also, doubled it. Yeah, and when he also what was weird is going through it, and then he would hit him with some like weird facts about how like, do you know that the, the original name of the character was supposed to be Glenn Borland? <laughs> wow, Glenn <laughs> Borland. That's crazy, man. Wow. The home improvement. It's, fact. it's a home wow. improvement fact. Wow, yeah. so that show's not even out yet. No, no, yeah. it's really not. He knew a lot. He yeah. did. Wow, he really did. Saw yeah. it to the future. You Back know, when Tim Allen was still a cokehead. Whoa. If you throw uh, Penny, where was he during all of this? He Doing was cocaine. actually selling cocaine. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Doing cocaine as well, right? Yeah, he better be. It's so. uh. a mule. <laughs> <laughs> now, up till this point, from what I can tell, nobody had mentioned Tommy Cocorellis in their confessions. Yeah. But when detectives investigated Robin's whereabouts during the murders that Eddie and Andy confessed to, they found that the crew partied at the Rip Van Winkle Motel. <laughs> This was where they'd committed their first known murder. And when they partied there, outside of the murder, of course, which they did often, there was usually a fourth guy who also rented a room with Eddie, Robin, and Andy. Gotcha. That was Tommy. Yeah. Uh, Tommy. Before that, Tommy Cocorellas is not on their radar at all. No. Wow. And once cops started speaking to the manager at the Rip Van Winkle, the manager said that he suspected that these four men were, quote, unquote, Cultists. Yeah. So when I mean, cops caught up to Tommy, their line of questioning focused on satanic ritual behavior. Yeah. That's where they began. Therefore, once mm-hmm. the cops talked to poor dumb Tommy long enough, he began <laughs> admitting to satanic ritual behavior to make the cops smile. And also, they lie know. to you. They lie. Yeah. They, they'll say stuff like, you know, you all. Like, we'll get you out of here. Like, this is our time to help, help me you. That's, help you. That's the whole thing. Being like, this is the time for you to tell us this story. And so they start to tell. And so you start to he like, they'll lie to a dumb person and well, say, like, all you got to do is tell us everything. You will let you out of here. We'll let you out of here. And then they're like, OK, well, now you're a satanic murderer. <laughs> so you're not going anywhere. Yeah. Takes two to tango. I think these people want to get it off their chest, too. I mean, Tommy. I know Eddie Spretzer definitely did. Yes. And then Tommy uh, saw shit and then it uh, and, and helped. I think he saw shit and helped and then decided to just also felt super guilty and wanted to get out of it. Well, the only murder that Andy confessed to was the one that involved the Rip Van Winkle, the murder of Lorraine Borowski. The cop showed him a picture of Lorraine and Tommy said that he and his brother Andy had taken her for a quote unquote one way ride out to the Rip. Yeah, he was a fucking shithead. Uh, And and then then later on, he'd go to recant everything, too, because he's another he's another one of these, which makes him extremely dangerous Mm -hmm. in my mind is the fact that he now that he's released. ah, I got to (laughs) wait. Now, incredibly, Robin Gecht was not charged with any murders. While he was implicated by the three other members of the Ripper crew in multiple slayings, there was no physical evidence tying him to those murders because he'd covered his tracks very well. Mm. Remember, he washed out the entire van after every single murder. He said Casey's main main issue was that he bar- he buried the bodies underneath his home mm-hmm. and yeah. he said the only way to make sure you get away with the crime is to not have any body. Yeah. They have no evidence. Yeah, yeah well, he had a, Casey had a lot of evidence then. He did. Yeah. 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 yeah, 26 pieces of evidence. Mm-hmm. And that's the other thing is that Robin Gecht kept his mouth shut from start to finish. However, there was the grievous assaults against Beverly Washington and Andrew York. And by the end of it, Robin Gecht was sentenced to 150 years in prison for all of his, once you put all his crimes right. together. Yes. Robin Gecht is still alive. Really? He st- still maintains yeah. that he's innocent of all the Chicago Ripper murders. It's, he's awful. It's just the worst trait of, yeah. every, of any serial mm-hmm. killer. Yeah. Technically, he's up for parole in the year 2042. He'll be 89. No, he's not going to fucking Well, 89, he might make it. I don't think he's going to go anywhere. He's not even that old right now. No, not really. And in a further injustice, he's also the only member of the Ripper crew who wasn't charged with and therefore was never found guilty of murder. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. But he was like the ringleader. But because they didn't no have evidence. that direct evidence. They didn't have that. But direct all the other people being like, yeah, I was doing it with Robin Geck. It's his fucking car. But again, you're looking at the three of them. Then as soon as the, anybody meets any one of the rest of them, you're all like, oh, you're terminally stupid. Yeah. Right. Well, not only that, but you know, you look at what you got him on already. You yeah. got him on 150 years. He's not getting out. Yeah, we and got you, him. And you look at it, he's like, is it worth a trial? 
Like, is it yeah. worth get like because fucking all the, this up? All they have is just the confessions of these other three guys. Right, That's all they got. So it's like, what's the fucking point? Yeah, we know? got him. Yeah. In 1984, Eddie Spretzer pled guilty to the murders of Rose Davis, Shoy Mack, Sandra Delaware, and Rafael Toredo. Mm. Eddie was sentenced to death in 1986, but his sentence was commuted to life in prison in 2003. He's also still alive. Wow. Andy Cocorellis, however, was not so lucky. Good. He took his case to trial for the murders of Rose Davis and Lorraine Borowski mm. and was therefore also sentenced to death. But while Eddie Spretzer managed to play the appeal game long enough to stay alive, Andy did not. Yeah. Was he just like, get on with it, expedite it? No, no. he's a moron. He's he, literally just a fucking, he's just was truly very stupid. He was the last person to ever be executed in the state of Illinois. Wow. He was killed by lethal injection on March 19th, 1999. He became a bit, of, he became a political football. Uh, between anti-death penalty and pro-death penalty proponents. They so, should just give him some Tylenol. <laughs> <laughs> they did. They did. Uh, so I'll get into this. Yeah. So I, a listener pointed me towards this book. So if you were the person who sent me this recommendation, no one else had sent me this. This book is one of the most, one of the craziest, most fucked up books I've read in a minute. It's called The Last Victim. Mm. It's by Jason Moss. And The Last Victim is about this young man that was a, uh, he was a, precocious college student that became fascinated with serial killers. So what he wanted to do was he wanted to figure out how to communicate with serial killers and basically find out the kind of what he called like hunting technique of the serial killer. How does one like get trapped by one of these serial killers? What goes down in the moments before a serial killer murders you? Like, was it in Goodwill or was it like a Coburger thing? He, no, was it's it in like, Goodwill. Was he studying? Well, to, oh, okay. It's, it, well, it's, you know, people talked about this. He's now, he died by suicide he, oh. after the fact. Everything, but what he would do is he would approach and it started with his relationship with John Wayne Gacy, okay. where he would research John Wayne Gacy, start writing letters to John Wayne Gacy from the character point of view of what he considered to be like his ultimate victim. So John Wayne Gacy, hmm. he sent a letter to John Wayne Gacy saying, I'm 18 years old. I'm bisexual. I'm confused with my sexuality. My father beats the shit out of me. All fake. All of it completely yeah, right. put together. And basically led John Wayne Gacy on into saying like, so I'm so confused and I don't want to know. And I hear your story and I'm, I'm so compelled by it. Yeah. He ends up in this like year long relationship with John Wayne Gacy, writing letters to him. Yeah. Eventually John Weird. Wayne Gacy sets up this whole thing to come visit him at the prison. He goes to visit him in prison. John Wayne Gacy has bribed several officers to do this in a sort of conjugal visit, which the Jason Moss was not aware that it was going to oh, go down like no. that. He arrived. He then is basically becomes almost John Wayne Gacy's last victim by essentially almost being raped in a jail cell by John Wayne Gacy. It's fucked. And it no. goes into, he plays all this, like you kind of just see what this crazy predator John Wayne Gacy is. And Jason Moss also then admits I was way over my head because I underestimated him because he is just this doughy fuck, which is how he right. lived his whole life. Yeah. And he got away with so much shit. He's this kind of affable Polish Day Parade, dude. He's yeah. a I mean, shapeshifter. It's, yeah. very, it's very easy to forget that he is John Wayne Gacy. Absolutely. Like, even when master he's, criminal the, and, and shithead. Even yeah. when he's doing the interview where he's like, and this is the rope trick. When he's doing it, you're like, yeah, let's see how this goes. <laughs> like, he's, he's, he's fucking his clown. And he he's played a clown. that game. All ended in him taking his dick out, stro forcing himself on him, taking his dick out, stroking it, being like, you know how many little shits died for this cock, is oh, what John Wayne yeah, Gacy said. Because he would pull out his dick. He's just like, hey, take a look at that. Seven inches, mushroom cap head. Look at that right there. It's nice. It says it fits real snug in an ass. Like, that was like yeah. his thing. Get he would sand, roll, yeah. like, to the kid. Real nasty. Real yeah, awful. Dude. It's then, John Wayne Gacy. It's John it's Wayne Gacy. Gacy. Yeah. He yeah. wasn't romantic no. uh, and he, yeah. so it was rough and so but what he then so when this episode happens it freaks him out yeah but guess who's john wayne gacy's neighbor andy cocorellis who john wayne gacy would affectionately call coco right like he'd be like oh coco over there he's kind of he's got you know he's a couple of bars short of a candy store <laughs> like Chicago that's guys, like thing. you know he would just like joke on him and stuff so john wayne gacy also like everybody had nicknames and like everybody loved him because he would again shape shape yeah. they all thought he would but Andy Cocorellis, when he goes, when Jason Moss goes to sit with Andy Cocorellis, he's like, this is an entirely different beast. John Wayne Gacy, unassuming. You kind of go in there and then you're sweet. He watched it turn on. You like yeah, watched right. him become Pogo, yeah. right? But this one, he's like, Andy Cocorellis, you're looking at a guy who literally is just a giant wall of meat 
that was obviously very dangerous, but mostly just like, I, oh, you know, I don't really know what's going on in here. And he cut me, he's like, John Wayne, he's like, you know, JW, he's crazy. He's a funny <laughs> guy, you know, like his thing. But eventually, yeah. John Wayne Gacy apparently had this thing called um, uh, PMA. Right, whereas you got to keep a positive mental, mental attitude. attitude. Yeah, wow. it's a big, big bad, big PMA. bad brain. No, it's huge <laughs> bad brain. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Gacy loved bad brain. But positive Coca- mental attitude. But Cocorellis was saying all these Gacyisms mm-hmm. to Jason Moss, so it's like, oh, like John Wayne Gacy was like grooming him too. Like it Weird. was this thing where he couldn't help. It was the way his mechanisms worked. So Andy Cocorellis was following John Wayne Gacy around like he was a do- puppy dog yeah. in jail. But it, just that whole, this book is crazy. And there are a lot of people are talking about, you know, what are the ethics? What, the, the, talking about Jason Moss. Like, why was he doing this? Is it cool to do? He was doing this as a young it's man. It's dangerous, dude. When you it's start just, flirting with these people, they, you don't are, know. they do have power in yeah. the sense that they don't give a fuck. Well, he also went straight to the the home of the yeah. Minotaur. He went straight yeah, to the, he did. the he center went, of the labyrinth. He jumped and, right into the final stage. And it was really very scary, but he did get to see the mechanism. And basically, John Wayne Gacy committed to all these crimes. Once he was hard, John Wayne Gacy became that guy. Right. Yeah. And so you can kind of see how those mechanisms are at play and all this kind of shit. But it is just wild. Like, because, but, yeah, but yeah, yes, but he died by, the Jason Moss ended up committing suicide. It's very sad. Very sad wow. story. Very, you know, he was traumatized by his own hand. He didn't know what he, he was in shock and, and traumatized because yeah. then John Wayne Gacy wouldn't let him go. Yeah. Because then he tried to cut him off. He tried to like ghost John Wayne Gacy, but John Wayne Gacy's calling his house. He's doing all shit. He's got his weird like lawyer friend that like he tried to, John Wayne Gacy tried to pawn Jason Moss off on his lawyer. Like they went to go stay in a room to go visit John Wayne Gacy. This is all again, this is in 1992, 1991. Wow. Yeah. So they go to go stay before visiting him in jail. And the lawyer has only rented one room. And Jason Moss, who's been playing off like he is this burgeoning street hustler it's all fake he's a right. nerd he's just like he's just a like very college smart kid. kid college kid and this guy he was like basically john Wayne gacy was trying to get him to fuck the lawyer and then he was going to come fuck me and then they were going to this guy was then going to be basically railed on by all these jail guards it's all highly corrupt it was just it ended up reveal, revealing a lot of shit all right i mean that's the thing about you know these episodes when you hear about it like what we talk like you know we talk about quote unquote like deep dives on serial killers we are barely scratching the surface on what actually goes on. Well, it's Richard Ramirez. Right. Like, uh, we're barely scratching the surface about what actually happens, what's actually inside, what they do, what their daily lives are like, what right. they're like in prison well, afterwards. Are, John Wayne Gacy know. had 50 guys on the line all fulfilling fantasies for him. Yeah. So he was playing out all these various fantasies for all of these various people, people writing him. Everyone's kind of lying. Richard Ramirez, he had a relationship with Richard Ramirez. Richard Ramirez was saying like, I got a network of cult leader of cult people around the world that are doing my murders for me. And you don't know right. whether or not that's real or not. It is interesting though, to like poke in and see their fantasy structures. You talked sure. to Jeffrey Dahmer, Jeffrey Dahmer just wants dick pics. Yeah. You know I mean, Jeffrey Dahmer was just yeah. like, just straight up. Like things are really lonely. In here. Yeah. He's an oddly simple. Cre- he was an oddly simple. creature. Yeah. 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 And of course they did inspire perhaps some murders. Oh, yes. So. I don't think that I think that Richard Ramirez was openly looking for people because yeah. then when Jason Moss wrote to Richard Ramirez, he wrote this thing being like, I'm looking to be taught in the ways of evil. Like yeah. He wrote this oh, super buddy, cringy you are, thing. You got to be very but careful. Dude. Richard Ramirez bought it hook, line and sinker. He was yeah. just like, but again, is it all real or is it just a part of these extended fantasies from inside a cell? Yeah. Well, all I know is we need a spinoff series on it. And I'm sure Peacock will allow it. I really think um, so. That'll be great. And uh, we just follow that rabbit hole. Well, we got Robin. Yeah. We got Eddie. We got Andy. Mm-hmm. But then there's Tommy. Poor, simple Tommy. See, even though Tommy Cocorellis was sentenced to 70 years for the murder of Lorraine Borowski as part of a plea agreement, his sentence was cut in half for good behavior in 2017. Mm. He was denied release that year only because he had nowhere to live. But two years later, in 2019, a church in Aurora, Illinois, the home of Wayne's World, I know, agreed to take Tommy under their care. That is where he remains, and that is where he will likely die. Until Why? he reoffends. 
I, yeah, why I, the fuck is he out of prison? Because it was an old timey law. I guess it because he was sentenced to seventy years, and I believe it was because he was not sentenced to murder. Because it was not he was not guilty of murder mm. explicitly. He was allowed to get off on half time on these old. It was some old Chicago rule on good behavior. Right. So thirty five years he was let out, but the dude does not cop to. Anything. Nothing. He yeah. believes that he's just like, I'm totally innocent. I did not do any of this, which to me makes, t- I don't know why. I feel yeah. like if he could have owned up to something and have said something, I'd kind of trust that maybe he's rehabilitated. Yeah, I don't think but so. But if you are not, if you don't, if what you, yeah. how do you, you rehabilitate? No, oh, he shouldn't be out. No. You know, a church is no. doing it for bragging rights to show how much they quote unquote care for points, right? Yeah. Like they just want him <sighs> to. So but, this church community is allowing this predator in the middle of it. I don't know. I, I well see know, what how that opinion. goes out. But that's the there's the contra, there's a huge contradiction right in the middle of this whole fucking thing. Yeah. Because the church is saying like we believe in forgiveness, we believe in rehabilitation, and at the same time, Tommy Cookerella is saying I didn't do anything. He's not asking like, for forgiveness. So he's not, and he he's also not, straight up says he doesn't believe in God. He's yeah. literally openly saying I'm using these people. Yeah. And they're right. like we're fine with it because technically we're supposed I guess supposed to be. Well, they get like points. Suckers to me. Well, I mean, that's the thing. It just, it just is very dangerous. Fucking, He's a very dangerous human being. There's such better ways to spend your fucking time and yeah. your money. If you're a so called Christian, there's such better ways to spend your time and money than to fucking take care of a guy who was connected to the Chicago Rippers. Yes, he he was one. Yeah. Even if he was the Dalmatian of the fire truck. <laughs> okay, the ma- you're taking one. care of the mascot for the Chicago Rippers. <laughs> yeah. Yes. You shouldn't be taking, you could, there's so much, such better things you could do if you're a fucking Christian. Well, and of course, it's very difficult to do these things without a little encouragement. And isn't that what a mascot brings? <laughs> <laughs> Halftime shows. Oh. First quarter. Ooh, he's going to dunk. The story, however, ends with another coincidence. It's not as big as the Gecht Gacy coincidence, but it's a coincidence nonetheless. Which also, they didn't go deeper into that. I don't know. He must, something must have gone down in some way that John Wayne Gacy was specifically talking to Andy Cocorellis after the combination of Robert, the, the idea that Robin Gecht and him worked together. There was something, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's John Wayne Gacy playing with everybody. I, I seriously think it's, it's John Wayne Gacy leaning over to Andy and going like, no shit, Robin. I knew him. I knew like, him. Like that's like I yeah. worked, I worked on a job with him. Cool. Yeah. Like I, I don't think it went any further than also, that. Like small world. Like that's what it is. Dude, it's a small world conversation. It is Soft white underbelly because of the anniversary. Also, just had an a interview with a guy that was a survivor of John Wayne Gacy, and I this sends chills up my spine. It's part of why I think that something why he had either accomplices or somebody else in there. They believe that he might have been connected to like a hundred murders. Yeah. Like he was. He was trolling. It wasn't. He was in Indiana. He was in uh, Kansas. Mm, yeah. He was in a bunch of different places too, because he used to travel for work. John Wayne Gacy was. I. I think that you know, largely one of the. That's why he is what he is. That's why right. in pop culture, he's probably one of the biggest villains just, in uh, uh, human history. Let's just hop right in here. <laughs> just hop right in. Yeah, he's the nastiest. Well, in 1999, Robin Geck's son, David Geck was charged with first-degree murder Hmm. and the gang-related killing of a man named Roberto Cruz. David spent 22 years in prison, despite the fact that witnesses on the scene said that Cruz was killed by two large Latino men. Must have been some kind of Latino. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) David Gecht, besides being white, was even smaller than his father. He was five foot five. He is definitely not a large Latino man, much less two. Maybe spiritually. You never know. (laughs) But he'd confessed after being beaten by a detective named Ronaldo Guevara. Mm. Guevara had also threatened Gek's then-pregnant 18-year-old girlfriend, allegedly telling her that she would have to give birth in jail if she didn't implicate David. It's definitely mm. a bad last name to have yeah. to be inside of a police station. I would have changed it. Yeah. yeah As it turned out, it. though, Guevara was a grade-A piece of shit oh, yeah. who has had seven convictions overturned since 2017 due to misdeeds involving false confessions. Mm, and there are 20 more being investigated. In fact, one of his victims was exonerated a month ago. Wow. This is what this is what being a bad cop leads to. Yeah. Uh-huh. Guevara would choose random men tangentially related to the murders he was investigating and plunge them into a near Kafka-esque nightmare of beatings and threats that all ended in false confessions. Because he's the one to do his fucking job. Yeah, he would just he was just fucking lazy and just wanted right. the clearance rate. As a result, David Gecht spent 22 years in prison. He was exonerated just last year, coincidentally having experienced in real life 
what was likely only a fantasy to his father's partners in murder. Wow. Well, let's just crazy. get right into it. Hop right <laughs> in. Just, well, let's there just it get is. to this. Let's the get to the meat of it right now. The Chicago Rippers. I don't want to hear the word meat. Um, <laughs> this is, uh, wow. It's rough, They're man. nasty. Yeah, it yeah. was like. Chicago. You actually wonder why it took us so long to get to this story, and it's but, because yeah. we have to really, we had to piece it together. Yeah. We had our whole team working on it. Shaw crushed this. Shaw, uh, thank you, Shaw. Yeah, we got I Shaw. Shaw. Uh, uh, yeah, Joel crushed Joel it. Joel crushed it. Yeah. We were really. Yep. Uh, this is a, so we it took a lot to put together. And I will also admit, but we probably got a lot wrong. You sure, know, I mean it's it, it's only off of Robin Gex, uh, the or Eddie Spretzer's confessions. Yeah, right. And then you have it's only Deadly Thrills is the only place where it's mm. all put together in one go. Yeah, like we look at the police reports, but if you are at you are only as fucking uh, trustable as the source, yeah. and then if the source is the Chicago Ripper crew, yeah, yeah. what is how true is it? I don't know. Absolutely. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for listening. Uh, hope you've learned. I don't know what. Well, to keep um, a positive mental, mental attitude. attitude. PMA. 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 Uh, even if you're killing a whole bunch of sex workers or children, you just want to put a smile on your face. You PMA. just need to remember because um, a smile uh, on the top, you know what it does for you? Sometimes it makes a smile come out in the bottom. And I mean, my fucking ass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be that. Um, let's see. <laughs> we have anything. Uh, thanks for listening to all the shows. Um, Anything to announce? Oh, I have some dates I should announce. I am. Oh, yeah. This is a direct quote from John Wayne Gacy. I am a PMA type person. Positive mental attitude. I don't have time for negative thinking. Yeah. Death is negative. So I <laughs> fill your head with that. Lying is negative. So I have no time for that. Yeah, yeah but what about all the murders, John? Oh, no, that it's was negative. It's that, negative that was thinking. a frame up job. It was a frame up job because of my connection to the goddamn Carters. <laughs> it was a frame up job. July 30th, I'll be in Ontario, uh, California. And you're gonna California. Most, when you go to Ontario, uh, Ontario California, are yeah. you going to talk about how John Wayne Gacy was innocent? Is that a part of the, the structure of the well, show? That's the or? point of the show. Wow. Yeah. It's, Good. Yeah, JWG question mark. Um, and then October 4th, I'll be in Brea. And then there's some other dates that I have. Great way to plug. I don't know if I want to plug the shows. <laughs> on this episode. Um, but yes, anyway, anything else do we have? What do well, we got? No, next week we're going to get super spooky. Now oh, good. I can go spooky. for some ghosts. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. Everyone's I'm like, honestly... uh, you guys don't cover enough blood. And it's like, well, I think we're good for Stop. a minute. Well, we did this, and then we're going to true crime, then we got our big history series, and then we're going to be doing more true crime this year, too. We're going to have, we got some, we're doing our international series, which is we're waiting on. We got some info coming in. Mm -hmm. All right. We're working really hard over here at the True Crime Factory. <laughs> <laughs> we're working pretty hard yes, at the podcast indeed. facilities. Uh, what will fruit? Roll ups roll out next. Welcome everyone to the show. Let's just hop right <laughs> Let's in. Let's just get right into it. Okay. Chicago Ripper crew. <laughs> How do they even wear one pair of jeans? Oh Lord, hail yourselves, everyone. Hail Satan again. Magoose delicious. Don't write any letters to these people. Don't touch they my are... breasts. Leave my sweet breasts alone. I love my breasts entirely whole. <sighs> You like it? You like any? Yeah, like very it? nice. Like give me one. Give me one more. Give me one more. Phantom. <laughs> the music of the yeah. night. Yep. Oh, sorry, buddy. Yeah, da, 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 da. The lights are out. The Broadway's the Broadway is closed. It will never be over for the Phantom. It's done. It is. This show is made possible by listeners like you. Thanks to our ad sponsors. You can support our shows by supporting them. For more shows like the one you just listened to, go to lastpodcastnetwork.com.